I'll read Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. As the Spirit fills us with the joy of the Lord Jesus. New King James Version. But How you, dare you? But you, have, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Notice what's not there. The spirits of just men, where are their bodies? And men, by the way, is a general term. It's inclusive. It doesn't just mean males. It means males and females together. Where are their bodies? In, right? in heaven in Jerusalem. Their bodies are in heaven? Or no, their bodies are in the grave. I mean, they're <laughs> in the they're grave. grave. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So notice what this passage affirms. For those of you who wonder if there's life beyond the grave, here you, you're told explicitly, physical death is not secession of life. You don't cease to exist. According to scripture, physical death occurs because your spirit slash soul leaves your body. Your body returns to the dust. And if you're a believer purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, you enter immediately into the heavenly presence of God. Where you're going to see God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the angels and other disembodied spirits. Spirits of human beings whose bodies have returned to the dust and you will dwell with them until the Lord brings you down from heaven and raises your bodies and unites you to your glorified bodies. Amen. That means if we die right now, from here, I'll be in heaven if I'm a believer. And I'm going to see all my loved ones. In fact, well, I don't want to get into this too much, but oftentimes what the Lord does is when your time arrives to leave this dimension and enter this heavenly dimension, He'll either send you loved ones to escort you on the way, or He'll send you angels or the Lord Himself may appear. And there are many documented stories of this occurring. I've mentioned one in the past, I want to mention it again. In fact, this dear brother is still alive. May God extend his earthly life and keep him healthy. Michelle knows who he is. Remember Jerry Comer? Yeah. Okay, Jerry Comer shared this testimony, and I believe Michelle was there to hear it. It was probably, what, four or five years ago? I was teaching at Golf and Shermer Road. Now, I don't use these experiences to prove the Christian faith. My source of authority and truth is the Bible. Since the Bible says that a person dies when a spirit leaves his body, and if he's a believer, his spirit enters the presence of Christ, these stories are simply what I would call icing on the cake, right? I don't base my faith in the afterlife on these stories, so I just want to make it clear. But because the Bible is true, I'm not surprised that these kind of stories occur. You get my point? I just want you to understand, you don't use these experiences to prove the truth of your faith. But because the Bible is true, don't be surprised that such experiences take place on a daily basis. So you see the difference? I'm not using this experience to convince you in the afterlife. I am convinced of the afterlife because of God's word, the Holy Bible. Now if the Holy Bible told me that when a person dies, he ceases to exist, then I don't care how many experiences right? I read, or hear that tell me otherwise, those experiences would be demonic deception. But the Bible doesn't say death is secession of life. So because it says a spirit of a person leaves his body and continues to exist consciously, and if you're an unbeliever, consciously in Hades, or if you're a believer, consciously in heaven, I'm not surprised to find such experiences taking place on a daily basis whenever death occurs. So is that clear? Amen. Do I want to be clear? Now, with that said, I'm going to share this experience as something that you should expect to find if the Bible is true. She knows who Jerry Comer is. Do you remember Jerry? Oh, yeah, yeah. you know Jerry Comer. You go to church with him, man. Right. Can you do me a favor? Sunday, when you go, Lord willing, to church and you see him, tell him to show you the young lady whose father died, who was a, who was a uh, what was he? Uh, sign, he was a sign, sign painter? Is that what they call him? Yeah. Yeah. Sign painter, right? Yeah. Is that what they I call it? I thought you were going to say Scientologist. Sign, sign artist. Scientologist sign. is going to have an experience where he's going to have it. <laughs> Hopefully if he repents by the yes. right? Yeah. A sign painter, right? Yeah. Sign. Okay, no, sign so. artist. Well, okay. he, he called him a sign painter, but if you like artists, I'll stick with artists. Sign artist. Now, true story, Jerry Comer shared it. And when he shared it, the person had just died maybe a couple of weeks prior to the time he shared it. Now, I'm talking about five years ago. So he came up and he says, I want to share a story with you. 
a member of the church, a young lady, a member of the church that Nasser goes to right now, and he knows Jerry Comer. Her father had just died. Now, she came Sunday and she was rejoicing. Now, people were kind of like taken aback. Hey, your father just died. Why are you so happy? And so she explained. She goes, I know it looks weird that I'm so happy even though I just lost my father. But this is what she said happened. This is what she said. And I guess she was there. I know her mother was there because she recounts what her mother told her father. Her father was a sign artist, sign painter, and got cancer and went blind from the fumes. All his life, you know, he's a sign painter. So from the fumes, went blind, got cancer. So on the day of his death, he's lying in his bed, and the wife was there because she mentioned what the mother said. You know, her mother, her father's wife. Anyway, he's lying down, he stands up. Now remember, he's blind, he can't see anything. He's blind. He looks up and he says, there's Peter and there's John. He points, Peter and John. Now the wife asks a question. You've never seen Peter and John. How do you know? So she asked him, how do you know it's Peter and John? And his response is, was, believe me, when you see them, you're going to know who they are. And then as he's about to pass, he looked up, and he goes, and there's Jesus. He's holding up a sign saying, welcome home. Oh, and he died. Wow. A sign. A sign. Of Thank you. Let me repeat that again. There's Jesus, and he's holding a sign saying, welcome home. And he passed away. Now, if you were there to see that, would you be sad or you'd be rejoicing? Because the spirit of your father left his body, he's now more alive, he's pain-free, cancer-free, and he's beholding the face of his God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, the same Peter and John knew that there was Moses and Elijah. On the exactly. And they did. Right? They didn't need to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and in fact, they told the Lord, should we, you know... Built three tabernacles, one for you, Moses and Elijah. That's Matthew 17. And so that's what he said to his wife. He said, believe me, when you see them, you're going to know who they are. So now in his case, whom did the Lord send to comfort him? Peter and John and the Lord himself. Yeah. Imagine that. Huh? The Lord Jesus himself with a sign. Now, do you guys make the connection why he was holding a sign? Yeah. He's a sign painter. Yeah. Yeah. So the Lord, to make it easy for him welcomed him by something he could identify and associate with, a sign saying, welcome home. Oh, praise the Lord. How humble and beautiful the Lord Jesus is. Did the Lord need to do that? Hold up a sign, the King of kings, God Almighty in the flesh, holding up a sign. But that's how humble and gentle he is to those who love him, to those whom he calls home. Right? Praise his holy name. What's your... You think, uh, I'm looking at Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, the first two verses. That we have a tent? Yeah, we have a tent that we're going to, we're going to experience even after this. Point. Yes, exactly. I believe that's that spiritual body you have by which you can differentiate someone from another. Yeah. Or can also refer to the robe. Because remember Revelation 6, 9, 11? Yeah. Go to Revelation 6, 9, 11. It may be even that tent he's talking about is the robe that God clothes the disembodied spirits with, right? He gave them robes. Yeah, because right? In Revelation 6, 9 to 11, another passage that confirms <coughs> that people who die continue to exist consciously and are alive in the presence of the Lord Jesus if they're believers, right? Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Read that for me. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now what altar is John referring to in the context of the book of Revelation? What altar? The altar of martyrs. But what altar? It's not called altar martyrs. It's an altar somewhere. Where? In heaven. The heavenly altar. So what did he see in the heavenly altar? The souls. What? He didn't see their bodies again. Notice what he did not see. He didn't say, I saw the bodies of those who were slain. Where were their bodies? The Where were their body, bodies at? In, in the grave. I'm sorry. I'll call her Nasser. I'll call you. Oh, no, I thought, because I took out my glasses and I saw it. Always it's someone else's fault. It's okay. okay. All right, you got it. No, no, you got it. All right, so you got it. The reason why he saw the souls, not their bodies, because their bodies were put to death. And their bodies returned to the dust. And will not come to life until the Lord returns to resurrect the dead. So notice again another passage that confirms those who die and their believers, they enter into God's heavenly presence as spirits slash souls. Now I keep saying spirits slash souls because there are some Christians who think that spirits and souls are the same thing and some think they're different. In Christianity, there are two views regarding the spirit and the soul. One view says spirit is different from the soul and they're both different from the body. So this is what we call trichotomy. 
They're trichotomous. There are three parts to man. Physical body, spirit, and soul. The majority position, and it is the majority position, is that the spirit is the soul, the soul is the spirit. So they're not different. They're actually one and the same thing. Two different ways of referring to the same part of the human being that's different from the physical body. It's just like me if I say, that's your body, that's your flesh. Body, flesh. I'm referring to the same physical material part of you, right? But I'm referring to it by two different names. That's the body, that's the flesh. So is the spirit different from the soul, or is the spirit the same thing as the soul? That's the debate among Christians. And I'm not going to settle the debate, because it hasn't been settled for 2,000 years, and I'm not going to be the first one to settle it 2,000 years later, right? So now, how many of you believe there are three parts to a human being? Soul, spirit, body. How many of you believe that the soul is the spirit? Soul is the same. See? Two opinions, you get 50, you know, two Christians, you get 50 opinions. Whatever it is, these are one of the views you can agree to disagree. You can hold to three parts to man, soul and spirit and body, so soul and spirit are different. Or like my brother here, soul is the spirit, the spirit is the soul, so there's only two parts to man. A physical material part and an invisible immaterial part, what we call the soul slash spirit, right? That's called dichotomy, the dichotomous view, right? What's, what's the uh, implications of trichotomy though? Like, so in heaven, the spirit isn't the soul? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Is it the mind? It's, I, I guess I don't understand. I don't that. understand anything. I don't know what makes the soul different from the spirit. I've heard people try to explain it, but they come up with diff different explanations, thousands of contradictory views. Some will say the soul is the intellect of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Now I say, what is the mind? They'll say, well, it's the intellect, right? But then you have the soul differentiated from the mind. So what is the soul if it's not the spirit? For those who believe the soul and the spirit are different. I don't want to belabor this point, but just what, do you, what, do you, what makes the soul different from the spirit? Those of you who believe the soul is not the spirit. What about your mind? What what makes the mind different from the soul? Emotions. So then if the soul is your emotions and the mind is your emotions, are you saying the soul is the mind? So what about the heart? Because it talks about the emotions and the heart. If the soul is your emotions and the heart is the emotions, so is the soul the heart? Yes. Is it? Yes. Alright. Then how, what do you do with Jesus distinguishing the soul from the heart? They're not the same in Mark 12, 30. I'm going to Mark 12, 30. Yeah, read that. Mark 12, 30. There you're going to see the soul, the mind, and the heart. They're different according to Jesus. They're not the same. So if the heart refers to the seat of emotions, and your soul refers to the seat of emotions, then the soul is the heart, right? But here in Je Jesus has claimed the soul is not the heart, and it's not the mind. Mark 12, 30. Read out loud for me. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Okay, notice. All your heart. With all your soul... Wait, so then the soul is not the heart? No. We're, we're going? With all your mind. Wait, so the mind is not the soul, and it's not the heart. So what exactly is the soul? If it's the seat of emotion, well, isn't that what your heart is? The seat of emotion? Mm -hmm. So is the soul the heart? No, here, the soul and the heart are different. Well, what is the mind? If you say the seat of your intellect, what about your soul? Is that the seat of your intellect as well? So that means the soul would be the mind, but they're not. They're different here. So what exactly makes the soul different from the spirit? It's, it's the word that you get soul. It's the same thing as suche, right? Okay, so it's, it's a word for soul. My point is, what makes the soul different from the spirit? The way that I understand it is the spirit is for connectivity with the God, but the soul is mostly with our body and... Yeah, but how, how can the spirit not be connected to your body when the Bible says, death is when your spirit leaves your body. So your spirit is connected to your body. Without the spirit, your body is dead. Oh, well, I mean, I have my own ideas, but then... The way no, what I'm saying, because the way you defined it, you nope. said, soul is connected to the body, but spirit connected to God. Well, without the spirit, the your body's dead. Well, of course, the, the spirit is in our body, but the, the point is, the way that we are connected with our soul is very direct on the car. I mean, literally every day, but with the spirit, we need to be fine-tuned with it. If we are fine-tuned with it, okay, let me just rephrase yeah, it. We are fine-tuned with our soul, but we are not fine-tuned with the Holy Spirit yeah. in us. Well, see, that's the way, this where you confuse me. Your spirit is not the Holy Spirit. The spirit in us? Yeah, your As human spirit. Christian? No, no, see, you're talking about your human spirit versus the Holy Spirit. Your spirit is not the Holy Spirit. No, as a Christian, I'm talking yeah, well, no, about we're not talking about. We're talking about now, you as a human being. Okay. There's a part of you called spirit, and it's also called soul. Right. Are they different, or are they same? Now, I, don't, I, know, I don't want to drag this conversation, but if the spirit leads us, that's okay. 
I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit in you. Okay. Yes, the Holy Spirit of God is different from you. I'm talking about you as a human being, you have a human spirit created by the Holy Spirit. Right. So is that human spirit that you have different from your human soul or are they the same? That's where, so don't get confused with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God is different from your human spirit and your human soul. So the Bible talks about you as a man or as a woman have a spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. It also says you have a soul, right? So the question is, is that spirit that you have as a human being the same as a soul or are they different? I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit now. That's the debate. So your human spirit, is it simply your human soul or are they different? They're saying it's different. So I'm asking those who believe it's different, what makes them different? Is a, is a, are we born, born spiritually dead? And it's, it's it depends what you mean by spiritually dead. I mean, we, we don't have... We don't have a um, connection to God, connection to God so, so to speak. Depends on what you mean, because Paul talks about those who are born, and up until a certain point, well, they are not age, dead. Let's say age accountability. Yeah, okay, prior to the age of accountability, are you dead? No, you're connected to God, right? <laughs> because you're, the Lord... You're, you're kind of like in a state of innocence. Yes, and so because of that... But Jesus still, says the still, kingdom belongs to you. Still under the sin, but Jesus takes care of that. You have a sinful nature that's right. dormant in your flesh. Right. It hasn't sprung to life, right. making you sin and thereby condemning right. you. Right. So the Lord, that's why the Lord can look at children and say, the kingdom is made of such as these. If these children are evil and damned from conception, then the last thing Jesus would say is that the kingdom is made of such as, the, as, such as these. But I'm speaking of, of, let's say, a person, that's an adolescent. Yeah. So he's not coming to know the Lord yet. Yes. Once he's you reach that age... He's spiritually dead. Yeah. Once you reach an age where you're now <coughs> cognizant, you have cognition that you exist, there is a God who created you, and there is a moral law that you're responsible to, that moment is inevitable. You sin and bring death upon yourself. So but then you die. But then I understand, I've always understood that the soul is, is like... You mentioned that you're, you're tied to, it's, it's tied to your physical and your, your senses and everything. What about the spirit? Once the spirit leaves your body, what happens? But the spirit, you're spiritually dead. It's, you know. Yeah, but who says your soul is alive? You think your soul is alive? You mean sin doesn't also condemn your mind, your soul, your volition, your heart? Which part of you isn't tainted and affected and condemned by sin? It's, it's operation. But your spirit is still operating as well. Is it? Yeah, you are. You're... And when you say dead, you think that spiritually you're not alive to sin? You're dead to God and righteousness, but your spirit is alive to sin. So what makes you think that your spirit is completely dead? Yeah. So, but, so my question is, which part of sin doesn't affect you? I mean, not so. Which part of you is not affected by sin? Does sin not affect your mind? Does it affect your heart? Does it affect your will? Does it affect your desires? Does, does it affect your body? So the only thing that... Sin doesn't affect as what? Which part of you isn't affected, tainted by sin? There's not a part of you that's not affected there is by one sin. Part. Which as one? As a believer, the new nature. But now, see, changed. now notice what you did. You just changed it. You just told me someone dead in sin. Now you're going to someone's alive in Christ. So can you tell me what your argument is so I can address it? He's, he's now adopting Muslim tactics on me. You see that? Listen, Abdullah. I'm going to get Ahmed to smash you in a minute. Okay, no. So when you're dead in sin, which part of you is not affected by sin? Every, every part of so even your soul, so even your spirit. So when you're saying, well, the soul part is different from the spirit because the spirit is dead, that implies the soul is alive. No, every part of you dies the moment sin springs to life, making you sin against God's law. Every part of you, your mind becomes dead to God and alive to sin. I your desires. I, I guess I always understood it as your spirit being more or less dormant. Because, yeah. uh, well, your soul would be dormant to who though? Is your spirit you're, dormant to sin or alive to your, your sin? Your soul is opened up to your own senses and the world. What about your spirit? Is your spirit dormant to sin or alive to sin? I always sin? understood the spirit being the, the, the connection we have between God. Okay, so you're, now your spirit is severed from God. Is it dead to sin or alive to sin and now your spirit is tainted by sin? Sin of like I said, if use it. Yeah. That's what I'm asking you. Yeah. Why would the soul be open to sinful desires, inclinations, and not the spirit. Then you're telling me that sin has no effect on the spirit. So there's a part of you not affected by sin. Sin affects every part of you. 
Sin taints every part of you. It taints you spiritually, soulishly, if you want to use that word. Taints your intellect, your volition. So that there's not a part of you, not under the dominion, controlled influence of sin. Until the Lord makes you alive. You could say, you could say it's, it, it is affecting your spirit. And that you're, it, it's, it's blocking off your... Okay, so then, your, your, why would you say that that spirit to... is different from the soul? Because the spirit, in one sense, is dead to God, but somehow your soul is what? So now you're just telling me every part of you is affected by sin. So then how can you not say that the spirit is simply another word for soul? But even, as, they're all affected. even as Christians, we have, a, we have a sinful nature in us. But we already covered that. What has that got to do with me telling you that sinful nature affects and taints your spirit, soul, it's, and mind? It's, it's because it's We're going to be here until midnight. It seems like a part of you is born again. You, so your soul is not born again? Brought, Okay, your spirit is brought Your theology is scaring me, so let me work, work through this. So I see if you're a heretic worthy of being stoned. Hold on. So when you're born again, you mean your soul doesn't need to be born again because it's alive? Or does it need to be born again too? Well, everything's going to be redeemed. So then what, my question is specific. Is my, is, is my body, my physical body redeemed? Is it born again? I think we're going to have to move on to the next point because he's avoiding my question. So let me ask you no, one more time. Let me ask you one more time. One more time, brother, because you're beating around the bush and we already wasted 10 minutes on this. Let me bring you back to reality. When you're born again, which part of you doesn't need to be born again? Everything needs to be born again. So we go back to the point I've been making for the past 10 minutes. That if even your soul is affected by sin, not just your spirit, your argument, which you use to show that the spirit's different from the soul because of sin's effect on the spirit, goes out the window. Because now you admit even your soul is tainted by sin. So what argument do you have to show that the soul is not different from the spirit? Right, that the soul, our, my soul was tainted by sin. Okay. I think we need to move on. We can, we yeah. can talk how, about how it. How does the word of God divide the soul and spirit? It doesn't. That's my point. It talks about soul and spirit being different in some places, but then the same in other places. But my question is... And if I give you a passage where the soul is the spirit, like in Luke 1, 46, 47, what would you tell me then? Well... How are we supposed to read that? It says, even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Hold on, I've got to do what Ralph Cameron does. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. <laughs> you gave me 1 Thessalonians 5.23, which I know very well, to no, show me the spirit. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23, which is even more powerful than Hebrews 4.12. Because it says that God will sanctify you wholly, your spirit, soul, and body. Right? So I can give you passages where the soul is different from the spirit. What do you do with the passages where the soul is synonymous with the spirit? You just created a contradiction in the Bible. Luke 1, 46 to 47. Can you go and read that there the soul is the spirit? So now I'm going to let you resolve the contradiction that you created. Luke 1, 46 to 47. No, I don't want to. No, I want you to go. No, I don't have my glasses. Okay, well, he'll read it for you. Okay, wait, wait. He'll read it for you. He'll read it for you. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Read Luke 1, 46, 47. I didn't think this was going to be a problem with the soul and spirit today. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And Before you move on, my soul, pay attention, this is what's called Hebrew parallelism. My soul does what? Magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. I'm going to have to give you examples to confirm this. This is not something I discovered. This is something common knowledge to people who read, uh, especially the Hebrew Bible. What you have in such portions of scriptures called Hebrew parallelism, where you have two lines basically making the same point in different ways. So the second line is saying the same thing that the first line is saying, but in different language. For example, read Luke 146 again, so just so you can see the point. Read Luke 146 and don't move, lose that passage. Okay. Okay. It says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. Okay, now remember, the Lord in the first line, right? And the second line, who is that Lord? And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. So who is the Lord in the second line? Is it somewhat different or is it the same? One is the, the Lord same. and God my Savior one and the same? Yes. Same Lord. You sure? Yes. No, it has to be different because she speaks of my soul and my spirit. Since the soul and spirit are different, the Lord and God must be different too. So rejoicing in God is not magnifying God? Or are they meant to be parallel in these passages? You can try to escape it all you want. This is how the language of Scripture works. My soul is synonymous with my spirit. Magnifying is meant to be synonymous with rejoicing. And Lord is supposed to be synonymous with God my Savior. This is known as Hebrew parallelism. 
And this is something every one of you will see if I give you a passage that's less controversial because you've already made up your mind the soul and the spirit are not the same. Let's go to Job 33, 4 to make my point. So you can give me passages where the soul and spirit are different. I'll give you passages where they're synonymous. This is how scripture speaks. Go to Job 33, 4. No, Job. watch here. Don't get disturbed. Just watch and read and learn what the scriptures talk. I didn't write the Bible. This is how the Bible is written. Read Job 33, verse 4. The, the Spirit of God has made me... Now remember, this is another example of Hebrew parallelism, but we found in Luke 1, 46, 47, right? The Spirit of God has made me... And the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now would anyone deny that the Almighty in the second line is the same as God in the first line? Yes. No. Is God and the Almighty one and the same? One and the same. Okay. Would anyone deny that the Spirit in the first line is the breath of the second line? No. Yeah. Would anyone deny it? No. Okay, when it says, the Spirit of God has made me, mm -hmm. and then it says, the breath of God has given me life. Right. Would anyone deny that me and me life, same persons being referred to? Amen. God Almighty, same persons being referred to? Absolutely. Spirit and breath, same things referring to? Yes. You'll see it here, but you won't see it in Luke 1, 46, 147. Why the inconsistency? You see it here, right? Spirit is not different from the breath. They're the same, right? Two different ways of speaking of the same entity. Just like God Almighty, two different ways of speaking of the same entity, right? But in Luke 1, 46, 47, my soul and my spirit, now that's different. So then the Lord there and God my Savior must be different. No, that doesn't work that way. This is known as Hebrew parallelism. So here, what Mary's basically saying is, my inner being delights, glorifies, praises the Lord who is my God and Savior. That's all she's saying. So she's not saying there's a part of me that, that magnifies God and another part of me that rejoices in Him. No, that's not what she's saying. She's saying, my inner being delights, praises, glorifies God, my Savior, who is my Lord. That's all that's being, being said here. But in saying that, my soul and my spirit are synonymous. It's not referring to two different parts of Mary, but the same part of Mary glorifying, magnifying the same God, the Lord, who is God, my Savior. That's how Hebrew parallelism works. Don't take my word for it. Get any commentary by anyone, and they'll tell you this. I didn't invent this. I discovered this by just reading and being challenged. So she gave me two passages, actually one, I gave her a second one to make it harder. Hebrews 4.12, where spirit and soul, the dividing of spirit and soul, right? This word of God divides even to spirit and soul, showing that they're distinct. Actually, I'd argue that's refuting you, because the spirit and soul are so interconnected, they can't be divided except by the word of God. So how are they different? It's like taking a coin, there are two, two sides of the same coin, saying, see the sword, the sword of the spirit? Word of God can divide the coin, the head and the tails part. Now, just so you understand what I mean. Here, do I have a coin? So I'm broke, I don't have no money. You too, you're broke? You're too. Yeah. <laughs> if I were to say, and I want Anna to pay attention because she seems to be troubled by this, the sword of the spirit is so powerful, it can divide the head from the tail. Right? Are you gonna tell me there are two different coins or two sides of the same coin? Okay, so now there you're saying join the marrow. Is, are, you, are you looking at it from a 21st century perspective? How did Paul understand it in the first century? Did they understand it that way? I you're applying, know. okay, well, that's, why, that's why. That's why. Yeah, well, that's why you have to study but the see, scriptures. But if half the people believe, I believe that um, the soul is different than the spirit. You can believe that, but these are not proof texts to support your position. Because then you're going to have to deal with the other passages that show they're the same. You're entitled to believe that. I just said there are two views in Christianity. But my point is, the analogy you're giving me, when you say joint and marrow, you're now looking at it from a 21st century perspective. It wasn't written to you in the 21st century. You need to go back to the first century and tell me what joint and marrow meant to that audience. Inseparable. You, you, you got it, not? Yeah, so she's reading it with someone from the 21st century with modern scientific understanding. You're telling me they had the same modern scientific understanding that they then for some time? No, they did not have it. You don't even need to tell me you don't know. Of course they didn't. They're in the first century. Because if they had your understanding, you're going to create a lot more contradictions for yourself. You don't know because you can eat the marrow bones which they were eating. And so the marrow bones, you're saying they ate the marrow so they thought it's different? Fine. You want to go with that? Now reconcile the contradiction with Luke 146-47. I can't. But that doesn't, you know, I think it's a mystery and we won't know it. 
until God reveals it. To All right, that's fine. Maybe we should go. Yeah, I don't know. And this became a problem, especially she got really troubled. I don't know why. If the soul is different from the spirit, let it be. If it's the same, let it be. But the arguments people use to show... I know Hebrews 4.12 and 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I used to use that to prove there are three parts to a person as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. But then I got confronted with other passages. I just gave you one. Luke 1, 46-47. The soul there is the spirit. The spirit is the soul. So now they're the same. So then I keep asking people who think the soul and spirit are different. What makes the soul different from the spirit? No one has an answer. Tell me what makes it different. Anyone I know? So uncritically we'll say the soul is different from the spirit. That's fine. You're entitled to that. I'm not saying it's different. But how much thought have you given to what makes the soul different from the spirit? I'd like to know what makes it different. If it is different, tell me. Don't just tell me, oh, you quote a passage where the spirit and the soul are different. Okay, that's fine. What makes them different? Because this passage are distinguished, but in other passages, they're synonymous. See, this is how Bible, Bible writers function. I'll give you another example, and I'm going to create an, uh, more controversy for myself. No, because I want to give you this example. Who is the bride of Christ according to the Bible? Church. Say it again. Church. The church? Jerusalem. That's Paul. In Revelation, it's heavenly Jerusalem, and that's not the church, it's the mother of believers. So you just create another contradiction. In Ephesians 5, 25, 33, the church is the bride of Christ. But let me show you that according to Revelation, the church in Revelation is not called the bride of Christ. Heavenly Jerusalem is called the bride of Christ. And according to Paul, heavenly Jerusalem is our mother. So the bride of Christ in Revelation is your mother. But to Paul, the church is the bride of Christ. Contradiction? Absolutely not. Because two different writers can use the same metaphor in two different ways. Let me prove it to you. I don't want to take my word for it. Galatians 4.26. Who's our mother? Galatians 4.26. We look at your controversy with soul and spirit. I don't say there are two different views. It's going to cause get. It's going to get me thrown out. I don't know an answer. For those of you who believe soul and spirit is different, you're entitled to it because there is persons that support it. But what makes the soul and the spirit different? I don't think anyone has come up with an answer biblically. And it was always a question to Yeah, and you're not gonna get you're not gonna get the answer tonight for sure. Okay. You're gonna get more confused. Because these are one of those topics, there are two views among Christians. There are those who there are three parts to man, like Anna believes and uh, Lorleen believes, but there are those and they're in the majority, I'm not saying they're right, believe the soul is the spirit, irrespective of passages which seem to differentiate them, because they'll use the example of a coin. You have two sides of the same coin. The tail is different from the head, but who would argue there are two coins? And they're inseparable, right? So they're basically one and the same, if you really look at it. That's how they view the soul and the spirit being distinguished in these passages. That's how they view it. Point is, if you believe there are three parts, more power to you. But still, something you should think about, what makes the soul different from the spirit? Good luck finding an answer, right? But here, what, what, I wanted you to read the passage. Uh, Galatians 4.26. Who is Jerusalem? That's above. Who or what is Jerusalem that's above? But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So is heavenly Jerusalem our mother? Yes. Mother of who? Of us all. The Who's us? The church, right? Go to Revelation 21, 1 and 2. Revelation 21, 1 to 2. 21, 1 to 2. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay, this Jerusalem that's coming down from heaven, in Galatians 4.26, what is she said to be in relation to the, to the church? Right? right? But here it says, this Jerusalem is the bride of the Lamb. Read Revelation 21, 9 and 14. So there is no contradiction if you don't understand that Bible writers can express ideas differently from one another because of the audience that they're targeting. So one person can use this metaphor in this way, and then this other person uses that same metaphor in a different way. If you don't understand that this is how the Bible is written, you're going to create a lot of contradictions in the Bible. Because in Revelation 21, 9 to 14, here for John, the church is not the bride, it's Jerusalem, the dwelling place of the church. Here, read it. Revelation 21, 9 to 14. 
Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, yes. came to me and talked with me, yes. saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Whose wife? The Lamb's wife. You're reading Paul. That's you, the church, right? Right. Not here. Read it. Yeah. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. The so the bride of the Lamb is who? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Which Jerusalem? The one on earth heavenly or the one in heaven? Heavenly Jerusalem. But didn't we just read in Galatians 4.26, heavenly Jerusalem is your mother? Right. Yeah. It's the church's mother? So for John, the bride is heavenly Jerusalem, not the body of believers. For Paul, it's the body of believers. Are they contradicting themselves? Absolutely not. Because they're using the same metaphor in two different ways. Right. This is how scripture functions. So to quote to me Paul in Hebrews 4.12 or 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where he distinguishes the soul and spirit to a Gentile audience, but then ignore when the audience is Jewish and to a Jewish mind, the soul and spirit are not different. They're actually the one, one and the same fails to appreciate the audience that they're communicating to, and they're speaking on their level in language that makes sense to them to make their point. You see? To a Jewish mind, the soul and spirit are one and the same. They didn't distinguish. To a Greek mind, they would be different. So it makes sense that Paul is writing to Greeks is saying, every part of you, the soul and the spirit, which you differentiate, is being wholly saved by God. Whereas when Mary is speaking, she's not talking to Gentiles. She's speaking as a Jewish, with a Jewish mindset, that the soul and the spirit are synonymous. You see, it's much more complicated than people think by just throwing out verses. Just throwing out to me, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, Hebrews 4, 12. Okay, and? Do you know the audience? Do you know who, who's being targeted? And why he's speaking that way? If you fail to take in context, whether the context is the chapter, or the audience, or the historical background, you're going to create a lot of contradictions in the Bible when none exists. Amen. Uh, and I'm just saying this, because this is not just the only problem, the soul and the spirit. Some places being identified as the same, other places differentiated. Just the metaphor of the bride. Paul says it's the church. John says it's Jerusalem that comes from above, which Paul says that's our mother, not the bride. Are they contradicting each other? Absolutely not. Because a writer can use a metaphor in a different way from another writer. You, you with me there? I hope I didn't confuse you. <laughs> that makes sense? He's just looking at me like... Is that clear? Yeah, absolutely. So if I ask you who the bride is, automatically you're going to tell me it's the church. I'll say, are you sure? What about Revelation? Right. Who is the bride in Revelation? And to make it, to emphasize that it's not the body of believers, but a building, finish reading. Yeah, finish reading. And he carried, him, carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So you have twelve gates named after the twelve, the twelve tribes of Israel, and then these twelve gates are situated on foundations. Mm -hmm. Keep reading Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now, the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So here the bride is a building. Mm -hmm. A building that has twelve foundations, twelve gates, right? That the believers will dwell when it comes down from heaven, because this Jerusalem will engulf the earthly one. Right? So it comes down. So that's the bride here. Go to Ephesians 5. The, the bride of Christ is the body of believers. We who are redeemed of the Lord. Contradiction? Absolutely not. So then why are they using the same metaphor in two different ways? Because they can. Who said that you have to use the same metaphor in the same way that someone else uses it? Where, where do you get that from? That's not biblical, right? So to quote me a passage where spirit and soul are different? Okay. Then deal with the passages where they're synonymous. They're the same. Notice I did not say that if you believe they're different, that's wrong. And if you believe they're the same, that's wrong. That's one of the disagreements among Christians. So we have to agree to disagree. But whatever argument you come up with to try to tell me the soul is different from the spirit, make sure it's a biblical argument. Because most of the arguments are not biblical. Well, I assume this. That's fine. Anyone can assume anything. 
It's what you can prove scripturally. And not just by quoting the verse. Here's another thing that by the grace of God's Spirit, the Spirit hopefully will teach every one of us. Anyone can quote a verse and make it say anything. The cults do it all the time. That's not what I mean by proving your case. Proving your case by understanding the verse in its context. Now even context is a big word. What do I mean by context? In light of the chapter? In light of the book? In light of all the writings of the author? Or in light of its historical context and the audience that the person's writing to? All the above. Right? right yeah. Now sometimes it's just the chapter. The chapter will be sufficient to tell you what the meaning of the passage is. Sometimes you have to know who he's writing to to figure out why he's making the point that he's making. So then you have to know who the audience is. Right. Is it a Jewish audience with a Jewish mindset? Or is it a Greek audience steeped in Greek culture, thinking, and philosophy? These considerations need to be factored in if you want to get the most out of your Bible. You're like, well, you got to be a scholar to do that. No, you just got to just study over time, trusting the Spirit to guide you to the right resources or make it plain to you just by reading it. But be patient and don't assume that you know the meaning until you've exhausted all possible meanings and see which meaning best fits the context. Amen. Yeah. Right? I don't want to torture you guys or upset you guys, but I'm here also to try to challenge you guys to go a little deeper in the Scripture. Because it seems like this thing about the soul and spirit troubled some people here. I, I didn't mean to trouble you, but at the same time, I have to be honest, there are two views. And if you believe there are three parts, God bless you. But don't look down upon the others who think it's two parts. And if you believe there are two parts, God bless you. Don't look down upon the others that think it's three parts. Right? There has to be... A willingness to be open to other views and agree to disagree when it's not essential to your salvation. Right. When it's, it's not touching the core doctrines of the Christian faith, be a little more open-minded. That's all I'm exhorting people to, be, to do, right? Just a little more open-minded. Okay, I disagree with your brother, but you're still a brother or a sister. And I hope you extend the same courtesy to me. If we can do that, we Christians would, would you know, be better off and get, you know... Our unity would be much stronger. Anyway, I, I spent too much time on the soul and spirit. How many people fell asleep on your live stream? No, you're, oh. praise God, everybody's watching. That means they didn't fall asleep. <laughs> they didn't fall asleep? No. All right, well, unless you have another question on this subject, I want to go to Romans 11. No, Sam, it, it's almost like when uh, when Jesus was preaching the parables, Yeah. in Matthew, his audience, he took into account. Yes. He would always say, he wouldn't say kingdom of God. You're right. Kingdom of heaven. Beautiful, brother. But then Mark and Luke, they would say some of the same parables and say kingdom of heaven. Beautiful, beautiful example. Yeah, and so there's beautiful. many times like that throughout the whole Bible. Now, notice what you said. The same saying of Jesus, Mark will say kingdom of God, Luke yeah. will say kingdom of God. When it comes to Matthew, kingdom of heaven. It's always kingdom of heaven. Why? Uh, because it was, well, mainly because he was at the temple and he was talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. Listen to this. And so... He held his audience longer before they got so angry and mad. This yeah. parable always made him angry. You got it, yeah. And it, it, it causes a lot of friction. Do you understand what you just said? Matthew's audience is Jewish. And for the Jews at times, out of reverence for God, they wouldn't say God. They would say heaven in place of God. Yeah, okay. yeah a lot of other things like that too, Matthew. Excellent example. Don't you still get it? Yeah, well, today, the Jews, if you talk to them, they'll say Hashem. Yeah. Hashem, the name. And when they want to say, let's say God, like in Hebrew, Elohim, they'll say Elohim. They'll deliberately mispronounce it. At the time of Jesus, because of the Jewish reverence for the name of God, they would often avoid saying the name and would use the word heaven as a substitute for God. Right. So Matthew, who's he writing to? Jews. Jews. So he is sensitive to Jewish sensibilities. So that instead of saying kingdom of God, he would say kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Whereas Mark and Luke would say kingdom of God because their audience is different. Yeah, he was talking Beautiful. to the rabbis he said under. Yeah, he praise the Lord. The Thank you for that example, brother. God bless you. What an excellent point. That the audience has to be factored in in order to appreciate why these writers are saying what they're saying. Precisely, 100%.